Okay, um, I probably could have wrote my name on the introduction slide, huh? <laughs> All right. Yeah, who am I? Um, so, anywho, REM, reverse engineering malware. Um, it's actually trying to make it look like a function call on Mac O, which is the executable uh, file format for uh, Mac OS X uh, and iOS. Um, and again, we're theming it, looking at bad apples. And by the way, that is custom artwork. You're all welcome. Um, at least 15 minutes went into that. Um, just a little disclaimer, uh, whatever it is you hear today, it's, you know, um, it's, it's really just my uh, compiled research from all the work that exists out there on the interwebs. Um, this isn't uh, specific to my employer. Um, I, I don't think a lot of what I'm talking about today is really unique to me, um, besides the resulting analysis, which we're going to be looking at, again, using uh, publicly disclosed techniques. Um, this is a little bit about me. Um, I got um, some time in the game. Um, uh, I've, I've done a number of presentations and write-ups. Uh, some of those are publicly available. Um, you know, definitely uh, speak with me afterwards if you're curious about anything I've spoken on. Uh, mostly uh, interested in uh, digital forensics and reverse engineering. Those are kind of my two go-to places. Um, this is a uh, Pretty much the, the format we're going to go through, I'm going to talk a little bit about methodologies that relates to reverse engineering malware. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, the steps we're going to go through for the specific sample that I have for today's talk. Um, and then we're going to go through, again, those major uh, phases, static, dynamic, and code analysis. And then if we have some time left, I'll gauge your interest. I do have some bonus content, uh, but I'm really trying not to, um, you know, uh, strap you guys down with too much if the interest isn't there. So let's keep it going. Um, so this is kind of a generally accepted uh, methodology. Uh, and then also how I'm going to represent that methodology. Uh, again, going through those major phases, static, dynamic, and code analysis. And as we're flowing through those, almost like a waterfall, uh, I'm just trying to list out what, you know, the different tools uh, that I'm using uh, within each one of those. Uh, just so at a summary level, we can kind of go, oh yeah, it was like those five things that he used to come to those specific conclusions. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, when we think about what does this cost, right? Like your time is valuable. And uh, as we transcend into the later stages of this methodology, um, in my opinion, uh, the complexity can go up significantly in order to have that kind of transcendence. Um, and so just be mindful of that um, for, you know, you're not going to reverse all the things you encounter. Um, but again, it is nice to have this skill set. So in a pointed fashion, you could go out there and maybe handle a sample that you're interested in. Um, so for this particular sample, um, again, these are the tools we're going to be running. Um, just leaving that up there for a second um, on the uh, static analysis side, um, you know, again, really what we're trying to establish is just some general properties uh, about the sample that's in our hand. And when we transition to dynamic analysis, what we're really trying to save is, is really digging out the code by just getting, you know, providing the malware effectively an environment that it can naturally do its thing while we film it. Huh? And then sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes we find behaviors where we're like, hmm, what's going on there, right? Or maybe we're like, well, hey, I wonder if I can tell this malcode what to do. And that's, that's really where code analysis can end up being really beneficial, you know, when you want to get into the business of maybe, you know, finding a kill switch or something else. Moving along. So um, here is just me executing, uh, you know, the file. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, just taking a hash of the actual sample. Um, and also um, looking at what file type it is, we can see for this particular um, executable, um, you know, it's called updater and it's a Mac 64-bit executable. Um, and then also I'm grabbing the hash um, and the SHA-1 sum. These are useful because from an interweb perspective, when we grab these very basic pieces of information, you know, that first piece of information kind of lets us know what data it is we're dealing with if somebody hands us a file. Um, and then the other two cryptographic hashes are just useful because now, you know, again, we can drop that in Google and just say, hey, has anyone else already looked at these out there in the world? And a lot of times, you know, people are submitting this stuff in high volumes to many open sandboxes. And, and so, um, you know, that could really uh, save you a lot of time 
you know, just going out there and saying, well, what did they find? Oh, you know what? That's really all I needed. Moving along. Um, some other checks we're doing here. So um, CO design, um, we're just doing a, a quick check against uh, the file itself uh, to see, you know, if it is signed uh, and then if um, from a signing perspective, uh, not just who is it signed by, um, but is it considered valid? And what's interesting is, is that, uh, you know, with the Mac operating system, you know, you can't really run an executable if it has an invalid signature. And so in this particular uh, scenario, um, this piece of bad code's actually been out there for a while. It's called Apple Juice. And Apple Juice uh, was a, a allegedly, I guess, written by the North Koreans. And so this is some government created malware. And um, anyways, we can see that it has a sign date of 2018. And here we are in 2019, it's pretty late in the year and this thing's still registering as valid. So. So it's a good sample. <laughs> so moving along. Um, and again, you can kind of see the commands. If you look for the dollar signs, um, right after the dollar signs, if your eyes aren't exactly tracking what's on the board is the actual command with the arguments that I'm passing to the command. Um, I just wanna say, um, you know, uh, I see some of you writing. Um, there is some printed material I have that I'm gonna talk afterwards that captures all of this. Moving along. So. Uh, again, just in the CLI, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, with that cryptographic hash in hand, we could reach out and, you know, check some of these open uh, repos. Um, uh, I've, I've heard <laughs> in, in some security circles uh, that, you know, when we put things in Google, it is possible for third parties to buy, for instance, uh, I believe they're called Google ads, where you can say, if someone puts a specific word into your search engine, I want to be notified about it. And so a move that you can get engaged in that might mitigate some of the risk of maybe a third party finding out that you found their software is just going directly to one of these uh, malware zoos, if you will, and just doing a quick check. And of course I pick uh, one of those popular ones, Virus Total. In the examples above, you know, the first one is just me using, um, you know, Virus Total makes available uh, through their GitHub some Python code that you can easily run. You just use your API key and all of us can get one of those. Everyone can register for a public account and get one of these API keys. And of course that returns interesting data. And then what I'm just showing here is, is that when we actually uh, check that cryptographic hash within um, virus total, because it's easy to make an exhibit from, uh, again, in the web page, uh, you know, we quickly get a, a, a peek into this file and immediately we know a large volume of antivirus engines are detecting this as being bad. And then bonus, uh, we see a name emerge, right? We see this name Lazarus emerge. That's really specific. And when you see a really specific name like that, it's usually from a, um, a rinse and replay perspective. This is almost as good as the hash in the sense that you can search for this really specific name and see if there is anything out there in the public. And again, I think you'll be greeted with, we're dealing with government code. Um, and so here's some of those examples. Um, Lazarus targets Mac users with malware. Lazarus group builds first Mac OS X malware. Um, obviously a slew of information, lots of references to apple juice. Um, so pretty, pretty interesting stuff. So anywho, um, so, we, so we take a closer look at the binary. And in this example, I'm using, uh, there's a FireEye, uh, it's, it's a uh, over glorified, from my point of view, just a string tool. And I'm just using that to, to do a, a, a check um, for what strings are in the file, Unicode, ASCII, all those kinds of things that you might be interested in. Uh, and then I pipe that back to grep and I say, hey, all that header stuff that the floss tool spits out, yeah, don't show me that, that's the next pipe. And then finally I do a sort and then I say unique and then I say, you know, I pipe it through more. Uh, most people like less, I like more for this purpose. And really uh, what we get into here, um, just kind of uh, going top to bottom. First off, we got some really interesting strings. Um, that's interesting um, for, for, uh, for our purpose because from a um, hunting perspective, you might be able to reuse these really unique strings to potentially find other variants of this mal code. Now I'm just kind of flowing down the list. Obviously there's a lot of white space and that's probably why it moved up to the top of this alphabetically sorted list of strings. But as we move down, 
we start to find that, again, when we did the Google, we found references to apple juice, and then here's all of a sudden the reference to juice, right? And so maybe that's the actual name of the code. That's kind of interesting. And then we get here, and we see some references to Pacific libraries. Uh, and so that's kind of interesting. Uh, this might be relevant uh, as far as, you know, if the code will actually run in the environment that you're presenting it. Uh, and then as we flow down uh, a little bit further, we start to find references to different C libraries. That kind of gives us some clue as far as what code it was originally written in. Um, and that's, oh. And then interestingly enough, we've seen address. That's kind of a unique thing in itself. Um, and then here we are again, we're just kind of going through the list to see what else we have there. And we can see right off the back that, you know, again, there's a connection update. We have a reference to an object called connect model. Hmm, maybe there's gonna be some network capability with this. Oh wait, this looks like, right? When we start thinking about HTTP headers, uh, I mean, these are really big clues. Oh, by the way, uh, apparently there's some function called upload and it's gonna be uploading a file called temp.gif. So if you were running, uh, for instance, uh, let's, let's say you're trying to help out a corporate environment, if they have their little network re, uh, flight recorder going on, you might be able to go, hey, why don't you look for a temp.gif that was recently passed you know, in, in, you know, in your HTTP headers. Um, and so we go a little bit further and whoa, Holy cow, right in the clear, right? We have an actual full domain with a specific file that's gonna be called. And that's, that's, again, that's pretty insightful. We, just being honest, guys, the work I just showed you, this is seconds, right? I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking right now, but really this is just seconds, right? We did strings on the file and what jumps out at us is a fully qualified domain name, a full URL. I've gotta say, this is pretty valuable if you were, uh, again, trying to help a corporate environment or maybe even just write a, a rapid signature to see what, what else is going on out there around this. And of course, um, again, we see some formats that would probably be put into the, um, the, the header of the communication. Um, uh, obviously, this is gonna be a web-based communication since we have HTTPS. Now, kind of a, a challenge for us is, is that this is telling us that it is gonna use an encrypted channel, um, so that could, that could pose some challenges. And again, we see reference to, even, even in the HTTP headers, the reference to juice. And so obviously this must have meant, to name it that, must have meant something really important to the author. And so if I was naming this right now, and, and just I'm, I don't need to, it's called apple juice, but if I was naming it, I would probably call it juice right off the back, right? Because there's just so many references to that in the file. Moving along. Um, so if y'all don't know Nini, right? Yeah, I see you, right? Like we got them, right? We kind of know, right? Lazarus Group, right? Apple Juice, got all that good open source intel. We've got network indicators. Like, you know, we can, it, right now we could kind of stop and, you know, if we we're trying to help a corporation or just write some detections, we're pretty far along already, but we're not done yet. All right, so, <clears throat> So for the dynamic environment, there is a little bit of setup involved, but when I say setup, um, you know, in my example, uh, you know, the setup environment, I'm, you know, I'm using uh, Mac OS X as the base platform, uh, and then there's two virtual machines I'm running in, in, inside of there, inside a, a private network, uh, and one of those machines, of course, is another Mac, and that's meant to provide the environment for our malware to run successfully. And I'm also using Rumnux, which is a, uh, open, uh, a forensic uh, open source uh, Linux platform that has a plethora of tools to help you fake out, again, that you're providing the full internet to your malcode. And um, I think I pretty much just said what's all on the slide. And I show some specific details like, hey, there's a setting in, in uh, the Rumnux machine where you can say accept all IPs and effectively any communication that comes to it, it's gonna respond to that. Um, from a configuration perspective, I end up taking the, the victim machine and actually say that the, the Rumnux machine is its DNS provider, it is the gateway for the environment, and I pretty much just tell my victim machine that everything must flow through the Rumnux box, and that sets the stage for the next step. So uh, here what we see is, is that, again, I'm just trying to get a baseline for, um, uh, you know, what's in, I posted the wrong one up there. That's, that's hilarious. Um, 
the intent here was to get a baseline for what's uh, in the environment. Oh no, that's right. And what I end up doing is I end up running, you know, privilege commands that super user do. I say find, I say starting at the root directory. Um, I don't care what the name of the file is, but let's just go ahead and make a record of that file, okay? And at this point, we haven't run the malware yet. I'm just trying to get a baseline of the operating system. You could probably do this with SleuthKit. You could do this by making a snapshot and then taking that snapshot and moving it to the side and forensicate it later. There's a lot of ways, but the key, the key point of step one is let's find out what files and folders are on the operating system before we ever execute the malware. And then the next step, um, again, we're going to turn up um, TCP dump and just make sure we capture any communications that are leaving the machine from that point forward. Uh, and, you, and this is kind of valuable because you could take a quick look and go, oh, these are the communications that are flowing from the machine without me ever even executing the malcode. And that's really useful because, again, this is all setting the stage for us to do a deferential analysis to say, what's new? Uh, and then finally, uh, getting into the third step. So here I'm using uh, FS usage. FS usage is just another um, built-in tool within the Mac operating system. And I'm just invoking that I want to see any file system actions that uh, deal with execution, um, disk input output, um, or any uh, calls to specific folders. And then, of course, I'm just taking that result and I'm putting it somewhere that I can pick up later. Again, the only thing we're doing right now is we're taking a snapshot, effectively, of the environment. And we're just making kind of a baseline so we can get to the good stuff uh, when the malcode does start running. Um, and then from a Rumnux perspective, again, that's um, so this has all happened on the victim machine, the top three lines. And then from um, the Rumnux point of view, we turn up a fake DNS server. How convenient that if you type fake DNS, it'll do that for you. Uh, and then also I turn up a simple web server uh, because at this point I was expecting that I was going to speak over uh, HTTP. Now we did see earlier that it is HTTPS, but anyways, these are usually my opening moves. And so that's what I do. And then we execute the malware and it blows up. Um, and what we see here is, is that there's kind of some lazy linking going on. So it says, hey, Whatever your run path is, immediately from your run path, what you should see is this framework available, specifically this version in this exact dynamic library. Okay, that's, that's what that says. And it says, hey, that library wasn't loaded, so we're done. Oh, by the way, that was actually referenced from the code that you tried running, and you can kind of see what path I'm executing that code from. And so it aborts because it doesn't have a library that it needs. And so womp womp. No good. With that being said, um, I actually downloaded this from another um, researcher's repo. And on that repo, they had a full um, archive that had, of course, the base executable, but also what that base executable was attached to. And uh, there was a uh, application um, that I guess was being advertised to specific companies uh, for managing cryptocurrency. I think I'm getting that right. And uh, anywho, that full application with the malcode embedded in it um, was made available through the third party uh, uh, researcher. And so I just take that entire um, package, it was a DMG file, and I, I attach it to see what's in there. And of course, what I'm greeted with is um, hey, there's a um, volume that's been attached called Sealess Trade Pro, which clearly should have my entire app inside of it. Uh, and then I just take a look at that uh, and I specifically expand um, a package file that was stored in there um, to the location expand me. And so um, if you're not tracking, uh, again, I mounted the DMG file, which is of course hosting some content. I check what that content is. I'm greeted with a package file. And so I use the built-in package utility to expand that because I'm trying to control, you know, the key thing when it comes to dynamic analysis is that we want to control all the variables. Now I could have easily from the desktop double clicked and just did the installer that way. But the point here is, is that you want to see all the steps. And so I'm controlling all the steps that might normally happen in an automated fashion. And so now it's expanded and it's waiting for me on my victim box. And so we take a closer look to see what's there. And what we're greeted with is a BOM, um, a bomb, um, which is 
Uh, it's, it's just a bill of materials, I think, is what it stands for. And it's supposed to tell you the inventory of everything that's included. Um, and then we have package info, which has some uh, header information. Then we have something called payload. And payload is, uh, again, it's a, it's a single file. It's a compressed file. And I'll show you how to deal with that momentarily. Um, and so I do a quick file um, just to kind of show, you know, it's exactly what it is I said. Again, bill of materials, some ASCII text, and then gzip uh, compressed data, and it tells you what the original size is. So um, the way that I deal with that is, one, I take a look at the bomb, and I'm like, well, I know what I need, right, for my malware to function, and I just start looking for that particular library. And I'm a lazy, I'm a lazy bro, and so I just do grip. I say case insensitive, show me anything that talks about network. And we think about our error message, this is exactly what it was looking for. That is the exact framework that was missing and why it wouldn't execute. So boom, we got it in there. Um, so anywho, um, I, I need that. I don't have that right now. And I don't know if there's something special about the code in this application, because if you go just Google on QT network framework, uh, again, that's, that's a third-party framework that you can easily download for yourself, but there might be something special, and so I decided to go with their version of the library uh, for which uh, was packed uh, in the original application the mal code was uh, associated with. And so I take the payload, I move it to a file um, called payload.gz, I unzip it, um, I, check, I check the file, right, because I, I didn't get... Um, I, I didn't know what I was getting out of it. And I run file against it, and I'm greeted with ASCII CPIO archive. Oh, C CPIO. Well, there's conveniently a command called CPIO, um, and it's an input-output. It's a compression command. And so I manually run that compression command with these switches, and I pump the payload into it, and this actually opens up the entire package. And now what we're greeted with... Um, is of course the contents of the package. Um, and when I look inside of what's opened up, there's a script folder. And looking inside the script folder, I see there's a post install file, okay? And again, if I double clicked, all this would have just happened, right? Again, it's all about control, right? We're just controlling each step so we know what it is that's popping out on our system. Um, and so I take a look at the post install, and actually what it ends up doing is it goes into, so apparently if I would have just let this thing run, it would have created underneath applications, right? It would have fired a shell and then moved underneath applications, the CLS Trade Pro app, and then uh, contents resources um, plist, we would have ended up adding um, into launch daemons a reference to that plist file, okay? Now, when it comes to how apps are structured uh, within the Mac operating system, everything is contained. So if you as an end user navigated to the application folder, the only thing you would see is the CLS app on the system. However, um, that's, that's something at that the presentation layer. The reality is there's a lot of content that's really just behind this folder. And so, uh, you know, when, when we look at that, again, we can see that there's a plist file there. And what this script would do is it would add that to launch daemons. And by adding it to launch daemons, we now give a system level, a root level privilege to that code if it executes. And then specifically, uh, what we end up putting in there is a reference to updater. And then we pass it an argument, and then we say run in the background. That's what the ampersign means. It's just like running a job in Linux, right? And so covertly, now you wouldn't know this, right? You would see the app pop up where the app's supposed to be, and you'd probably start using it. Oh, this is a great freaking app. But in reality, here's this thing that's running in the background quietly, and then if the system uh, reboots, it's going to be launching with root level privilege. So we take a look at, um, again, post install, and this is just me. Uh, <laughs> breaking it down. Back here, I was uh, catting it out, but I guess here I thought I'd be a little more verbose. Um, and what's important here is, is that when we look at um, specifically what's inside the, uh, the, the plist file that's being referenced, um, we can see exactly what it is that's going to be staged. 
And then we see uh, again that there's a, um, uh, a setting being established within launch daemons that says run this every time the system loads up. And so it's just a little more um, detail, but you know, back here, um, we're looking at the, where's the script? So we're looking at the post install script. The post install script is referencing this property list file inside the application container. And here we use another native tool called PLUtil, uh, and we actually look at the inside of what's in that property list file that's associated with the application. And so every time that application is launched, it actually executes all of this. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> anywho, uh, at this point, you know, we're able to execute, uh, and I'm just showing what results I get. I, I just wanna say there's, there's nothing surprising here. If you did a TCP dump and you looked at your result, you would see these communications coming off a vanilla MacBook, okay? And so once I ran the code, I had the same results I was having with a vanilla MacBook. And I'm like, hmm, what's wrong? Well, you guys already know what's wrong, right? Because I told you earlier, it's HTTPS, but we'll play along, right? You're, you're stupid me, it <laughs> doesn't know any better. But we take a look from a DNS perspective and we can see, right? Because we remember when we took our strings, this is the exact FQDN we saw, right? And so we see it being queried and we know what the response is. The response is that Rumnux box, this guy, that's who's hosting that domain. But again, back here, we don't get the communication. So the DNS side of it checks out, so we keep moving. And again, this is just what it would look like with fake DNS. Um, so one part, I'm looking at it from a packet capture perspective. Um, this is actually what you would see uh, in your shell if you're running a fake DNS. We can see you know, there was queries for those exact uh, domains. And so, anywho, uh, we realize, oh crap, it's 443, all right? We look back at what we got from our strings and everything else, and so we spin up a listener on 443, we run the mal code again, and we get a bunch of gobbledygook. Here's the bottom line. We know from our strings relatively what's gonna be inside of the content, but we don't know exactly what's inside of the content, and that's kind of a challenge we're in now. But what we do know with absolute certainty is that that domain that we saw is absolutely going to be queried. Where in static analysis, it's possible that could have been a junk domain. There could be 50 um, FQDNs that you turn up and none of them are rele relevant to the actual execution of the malware. But here we have proof. If we execute that mal code, we're going to go to that domain. And we know it's going to be over 443. So those are still really useful things we got. And again, from a time perspective, not much time has went by. You know, we're still, though I'm doing a lot of talking, we're probably, you know, looking at maybe 15, 20 minutes worth of work here. Moving along, um, we also interrogate um, um, some of the um, files that were created by our FS usage and everything else. And something that was interesting, I didn't show the string, but there's all these references to Martinez user. I don't know what that is, but I thought that was interesting by itself. Um, and then the other thing that was kind of interesting is, is that there's a INI file that gets created that if you do the, uh, the forensics later, this INI file is not on the disk anymore. And so this thing comes into existence. So what is that? So just some interesting stuff from just executing it. So anyways, right, we're drinking up that apple juice, right? Sucking it up. Because again, at this point, you know, you really can't, there's no way as the third party that you're gonna successfully use this payload uh, without discovering, you know, this payload being discovered. So again, if you were on the very uh, front end of this, um, when that app was put into deployment, you could probably iterate this all across the environment. With that being said, I feel like there's some unanswered question and that is, what is it we are sending? Okay. so. We take a dive, and uh, this is from a code analysis perspective, and I wish I had a way to zoom, but I don't, folks, so you may have to just um, squint a whole lot. But pretty much what I'm showing here is, is that we have kind of a, a standard uh, preamble. Um, this is really the main function being called, or you know, the entry point into the application. And uh, what's interesting is uh, when we look at it, 
is that the app itself actually does a check. It does a string compare. And so here's the thing. You could, uh, this is me taking the executable. I'm dropping it into Ida so I can perform code analysis. And uh, from there, um, you know, I just go to a visual view on the code so I can quickly make this uh, exhibit for everyone. And really the only thing uh, this little screenshot is showing is, is that if, if um, this check does not check out, which is, did you pass it the argument check update, the mal code immediately closes, okay? And so that's, that's so it's really important uh, is, is the only thing I'm gonna point out here that in order to actually get this code executing, you have to pass it the check update. There was a, a earlier in the process, um, even though I saw the check update argument being passed, I chose to forego that to see what was happening. And surprise, surprise, the mal code would not run. And just here's the actual, you know, devil in the details. Um, <clears throat> and then um, in here, it, there's, again, this is hard to see, uh, at least it is for me and I'm up here, um, but it's C-O-N-N model colon, colon, start. And so what this, when I, when I Googled on it against QT framework, effectively what I came up with is, hey, here's where we're actually gonna start building the network connection. So immediately after you pass the argument check update, we start to go through the process of building what our network communication is gonna be. And so uh, this is, <laughs> this is um, uh, again, I, I purposely chose this section of code. You can kind of see like the little dotted line. And the only reason why I chose that is I felt like it would be relatable because we looked at those strings earlier and something convenient that Ida does and, and a lot of, um, th there's some other competing disassemblers that do this, is it'll actually um, take <clears throat> points that are being referenced in the file, data that's being referenced in the file, and it'll display it to you what that data is that's being used. And so we can see um, up here that well one, there's some XOR function that's being called. Um, and then we can also see, again, the reference to juice, which again, this looks like it's gonna be part of an HTTP header. So that's a valuable insight if we're building detections. And then as we uh, kind of move through this big hunk of code, again, we can see the check update being called. And so again, we can verify through code analysis that we're on the right track, that we're actually looking at the right function that caused that initial network communication to occur that we got all the gobbledygook for. Okay. And so um, just taking a, a, a look at those data references, um, this, this is actually in the data section of the file. And the only thing I'm doing is, is here it's a little, little clumped up. And so I actually just go to those references and I look at it longhand, and just here again, you can see in you know plain detail uh, the full string itself that that's being used, all that kind of business. You can see the full um, HTTP header being built. Uh, we can see what the uh, user agent's going to be. This is huge if you're building like a network-based detection, because uh, if you take that um, user agent string, that's going to be specific. That's these two lines. That's going to be specific to this mal code running. So this is really valuable from a, you know, building a network detection perspective normally. Um, and then also, whoa, what's this? In, in plain text, get process list. So I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say that it is possible that when we see the upload occurring, the upload function being called, that we may be passing a process list, okay? And this, again, this is all in plain text nothing fancy has happened. Again, code analysis. And so I go a little bit further. This is, um, so Ida Pro, I think, was it some ex-KGB Russian fellow, I think made that one. And affectionately, the NSA has also released a, uh, a, code, uh, um, a code analysis tool, this assembler um, called Hydra. And so, so we take the file and we drop it into Hydra, and I just thought this was kind of cool um, right off the back. It kind of gives you some of the metadata that is typically packed in with an executable right off the back, so it's almost like static analysis. And <clears throat> what's neat is it tells you the, you know, the last date, uh, you know, the file was modified, 
Um, you know, it tells us, uh, you know, what the compiler was that was used. Apparently it thinks it was GCC that was used. Um, you know, it, it tells you, uh, um, again, MD5 hash, SHA-256 hash, those are all things that you can leverage. Um, it tells you from a Maco perspective that this is meant to be, you know, an executable. Um, it tells you that there's um, um, some weak defines in the file, and that's where we had the at run path. That, that's really what it's talking about. Um, but any, anywho, like if you're reading the header information, if you saw that, um, you can get into some other risks like, um, like um, what is it called in Windows, like, uh, like DLL hijacking and stuff like that. Anywho, um, and then, then, then smartly, uh, as it's processing, it goes, whoa, I need these other libraries in order to function. And by the way, I don't see them. And so it's also identifying the QT network and then another one, QT core. And it's really laying out that, hey, there's some other library calls that you're not giving me access to that are definitely playing a role uh, in this particular file. Uh, we move forward. Um, and so this is me just showing a decompiler on that same um, front section of code that we're looking at just moments ago in IDA. Uh, one of the interesting thing is, is that that was the freeware IDA. Now this is the, the public release um, version of Hydra from NSA and they give you a decompiler. You actually have to pay quite a bit extra if you want that from the folks who make IDA. And what I liked is without me, I, I didn't put any effort into this, but again, we can see the, the, the main function here. We can see what parameters um, are potentially expected. Um, and I think what's really key is, is that earlier, you know, we were kind of looking at, um, you know, the disassembly versus here, we kind of get it, you know, in a C language and we can see that, hey, there's a string compare happening to some character that's being pointed at, okay? And a parameter that was passed to the program. And we can see that check update is, what it should match. And then uh, again, we can see connection model being called if there is a match. Otherwise, we're gonna exit, right? We, we never get to this section of code for the network connection to be called. And so I, I show this to say this, if you're not comfortable with disassembly, one of the nice things about um, this NSA tool is that it does have a built-in decompiler. And so if you've worked with C++ or C before, um, this might be a little friendlier to you to just go look at this. Okay, um, and this is another feature that I really liked. Um, I kind of looked at um, everything from a, a function point of view. Um, hats off to my colleague who's not here, Darkwing Duck. Um, he was uh, helping me out with this one a little bit. Um, I wasn't familiar with all the features in Hydra, and so he showed me this. And this is normally what I do uh, into a, a, mo a mind map. I usually make a mind map. And in my mind map, I'll usually put like all the functions I can go to from a specific function. And it's almost like building, um, you know, if you can imagine like making a strip map or something like, oh, you know, how do I get to the store from here? You know, you kind of write out like the major milestones that you might know on a particular journey. And it's kind of the same thing here. And so we can see that, you know, from start, we can see that there's several uh, uh, function calls going on. Uh, and the ones that are interesting, of course, I've highlighted, right? We're going to get the local host name. We're going to get what the operating system product type build right? So we're collecting details on the operating system. Um, you know, again, product version, we're going to get the kernel version. And so we're collecting a lot of data and all those functions are being called uh, from this one uh, start function. And so that's that kind of, again, we haven't really done a lot of reversing, but just looking at the function calls, you can kind of go, oh, it's collecting software versioning from your machine as well as a process list. That's what we've just learned from, again, you just have to imagine I'm doing so much talking, but this is again within minutes, right? This is all happening within minutes. We have not spent a lot of time yet. Um, and so here, um, let me see which one I'm looking at. Um, 
So apparently I wanted to, to draw attention here. Uh, and again, we have our, our Git process list. Um, and I, th I think really, in my opinion, really the only thing that's key here is, is that we're, we're gonna end up using the result of Git process list as an argument um, to XOR encrypt. That's really where this ends up flowing to. And the result from git process list, there's a byte array that gets created, okay? And the result of that uh, byte array, um, again, ends up getting moved down here to be encrypted. And so because I saw that, I said, oh, encryption. And so again, in, in this tool, you can search the symbol tree. And so I think I just put in, what was it, the word key or, yeah. I just searched for the word key. And all of a sudden I got a reference to XOR key and RC4 key. Wait, we had SSL communication earlier, right? How much do you wanna bet that RC4 key is relevant to our SSL communication? Again, we know the data that was collected from process list is being passed here. And let me, let me speak to process list. Back here, this is git process list. This is all the stuff that's being collected inside of git process list. Okay, now we're gonna flash forward. And then here, git process list is gonna go to a function called Zor encrypt. There goes the key. There goes the RC4 key. And so we look at those, and now I'm just gonna walk to the other side of the room. We look at that exact reference and we can see the exact key. And so in theory, in theory, maybe we could take that PCAP we just got and maybe even decode it because we've got the keys. And again, here's the RC4 key. So these are big, big steps. Um, and again, this is just static code analysis. We're not debugging yet. And that's another move we can make when we're in the business of doing code analysis. So I gotta be honest, guys, you are not operating successfully in my environment, and I know what you're up to when we're at this level of code analysis. Um, I probably should have put a percentage here of, as far as how much of the code we analyzed, but effectively all the app functions, all the custom made user functions, we've looked at together already. So we own, at least for what this malware can do, we, we own that. Um, so <clears throat> again, thank you again, Darkwing Duck. He's, he's not able to join us today. Uh, but uh, again, the, it, this was written in C programming language. I've done some presentations reversing, uh, you know, uh, malware written in other um, programming languages. Um, this is the SHA-256. Um, this is Objective-C. This was um, uh, actually where I got the malware from originally. And what I'm referencing here is, is again, where he's posting uh, Mac malware that any, any one of us could go grab. Um, and then this is the actual blog entry where he does an analysis. And so I share that, not because I used his material, okay? But I think it'd be fun, uh, I'm gonna share this presentation to go look and say, well, what did he just show us versus what did this person, who does this as their day job, what did they find? And I think you'll find um, that the work is dangerously close. Um, and then here's just another um, blog post I thought was really good. It's talking about Lazarus Group and this specific campaign they ran. Um, and here's where I, I guess I have to ask the question, right? Do we have time for the bonus material? Is there interest? Yeah, yeah, all right, I need everybody thumbs up. All right, no one's running out of the room. You good, dude? All right. All right, I want to kill you guys with this stuff. I just want to say um, e everything uh, that you're seeing here, how to set up for this, uh, I've created an index. I'm going to talk about that after the presentation um, if you guys are interested in that. Um, so here we are. Now we get into the debugging, okay? And I'm trying to go through the steps that are, uh, I, I try to show all my setup steps. And uh, what I'm showing here, um, is effectively I'm just checking to see what terminal I'm operating in. So that's the TTY command. Um, and then I'm using a, another native tool available in the Mac operating system, LLDB, okay? 
And once I'm inside LLDB, um, again, I'm just telling it that, hey, target create, okay, and there's nice built-in help, and again, I've, I've documented all this for you guys, but um, I do target create updater, so I'm just saying, hey, here's the file that I want you to execute. And then underneath settings, I say set the target run arguments to check update, okay? And so it's just like I typed it out in the command line, except now I have to figure out, you know, how it is I tell the, the program arguments. And so I did that research. Um, and then finally I say, hey, when you launch this, uh, I want you to take any errors that are generated and send it back to my terminal session, okay? And that's what that, that process launch dash S dash E, and then me specifying the device of my terminal session, which we identified earlier. Okay, now it's running. And what it does is it, it runs uh, up until the start point, okay? And then it just kind of spits out um, what it is that's there. And so <clears throat> what I end up doing, uh, I guess, just at a glance here is that I just take a look and I say, hey, let's examine you know, what's right here. And this is just me um, examining instructions. So that's X slash I. And I say X slash I, so examine the instruction at this address. That address is where it shows us the entry point is for the program. And the only thing I want it to do for our purpose is to show that we can look at this ourselves. We can look at the code ourselves as it's executing, okay? And so here it is pop, uh, you know, whatever's in the queue into um, the input register. That's what RDI is, okay? And then I say, oh, okay, well, because once wasn't enough, I read the instruction at the same address again. And then I say, oh, okay, well, let's read. Then I do examine slash the number 10, a quantity, I. And I'm just saying, now show me 10 instructions and Hopefully it's on the next slide. Oh, there it is, 10 instructions. So boom, now we got 10 instructions. So now we're looking at the first 10 instructions in the program, okay? Now I haven't shown you anything interesting yet. Um, you know, at this point, this is not, uh, what I wanna show is some transcendence between what we saw in Ida and what we saw in um, Hydra, that again, in this debugger, um, we can see the same things. And so uh, what I try to do, um, and I'm bad, I'm bad at this, uh, apparently uh, BP does not represent breakpoint, but I'm trying to set a breakpoint and I try to set it at um, this specific address. And what that address is, it's actually where um, the, the, the request, uh, where, where the, 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 the function call initiates where we're starting to build our network connection, okay? In the place that I got this address from, um, I'm also looking back at Ida and I'm also looking back at Hydra. And if we think back to those screens, oh, I only put it in visual view. Anywho, if I, if I take it out of this view, I can see the addresses for everything. And so the only thing I did was, is I, I took it out of the graphical view and I said, what's this address? And then I ended up using that in my debugging. And so the time that you spend using a disassembler or a decompiler, you can actually play it forward and also use it in your debugger. And so I go ahead and I set a breakpoint on, on this very uh, interesting section. And then I also examine uh, five instructions. And again, earlier we we're talking about this, right? We we're talking about the XOR crypt. Okay, and I say, hey, just beyond that XOR crypt, what else is it we see? And the very next thing we see is, is the entire HTTP header being built for the communication. And so earlier, we kind of saw that piecemeal when I was going into the data section of the file. Here, examining the code in the debugger, we can actually see the entire string that's gonna make up uh, our HTTP header. And that's really useful because now, now this is potentially a detection that you can again create and even have more confidence that the stuff that we saw earlier is gonna work in the exact sequence that it's being put together in. So we go a little further, I think. Oh man, I really did a number for you guys. So, um, uh, all right, so here I'm starting from the top to the bottom. I'm reading registries and so I, so I say, um, for registry RIP, 
RIP and 64-bit systems is where the uh, instruction that we're on in that exact moment um, is. Um, and uh, in, that, in that register, you, you could almost imagine it like a variable that the, that the CPU uses. And so, um, anywho, the CPU has to know what instruction it's, it's on, and so RIP is where that's captured. And so I look at RIP, uh, and then I just kind of say, hey, from RIP, because apparently I've just hit my breakpoint, I say, show me uh, the next three instructions. And what I'm greeted with is what we saw earlier, okay? Um, that again, the, the following instruction is, you know, this HTTP header being built. Um, and then I read um, what's inside of RDI. Now, uh, RDI is a register that the CPU uses to know where to write data, okay? And then there's RSI, that is where we're sourcing data from. And so whenever we're doing a lot of reads and writes IO, those are two really important registers. Um, and so we, we go a little bit further here, and uh, this is just such a fantastic picture, guys. If it's terrible for you, it's, it's awful for me. Uh, and so I read RDI, and I say, um, okay, well, what's, what's at RDI? And earlier, I'm not gonna flip back to it, but there was a command ran its load effective address. And so actually what we have inside of RDI is the address of another location. And so I say, hey, show me what that address is. I get that address. And then I say, okay, at that address, what is the address you're pointing at? Okay, because it's, so it's like a pointer to a pointer is kind of what's going on here. And, and so, so finally, when I get that, that real address, I go examine it. And again, we're right before, again, this is debugger. We're live running the mal code. And we're right before we get to the XOR encrypt function. And man, guys, I wish you could see this from back there, but we have the running version of Mac OS X and we have all the processes that are running in memory that are stored there. And that's about to be used as an argument inside the XOR key function. I apologize for the blurry image. But this is pretty big, right? Like this is like, you know, before, you know, we did our dynamic analysis and we saw the gobbledygook and then we did our code analysis and we're like, oh, based on these function calls, <coughs> you know, we see, we see a process list being called and we see the kernel version and the app versions, uh, all the stuff being collected, right? So we could say that, but we haven't actually seen it. Now we actually see our systems information about to be passed to this third party before it's encrypted. And so, and then here it is, uh, after the XOR function runs, everything of course is encrypted. I'm just rereading, um, you know, the destination location to see what's there. And this, this is what you're greeted with. It's all garbage now, but it's, that garbage was this at one point. <laughs>